What I was wanting to do today in the next 15 minutes or so is just to speak a little bit about compassion, have you think a little bit about compassion and maybe even feel a little bit of compassion, perhaps starting with compassion for me. Um, I've been, like a lot of you guys too, I'm sure, I've been um, for a long time thinking about compassion and its role in, in our clinical work. And, um, but recently, um, the question of compassion has come into sharper focus for me with its more formal inclusion now uh, in the motivational interviewing text. Um, they described that to be compassionate is to actively promote the other's welfare, um, to give priority to the other's needs. And uh, that was in the, the third edition by Miller and Rolnick. And so the first curiosity I had was, well, why did they um, have to, or decide to, add compassion? And uh, the MI spirit, previously uh, comprised of collaboration, evocation and respect, or, or autonomy support, was kind of thought to not completely uh, differentiate what the MI practitioner might be doing. Maybe um, dif doing different from the approach of, say, a salesperson. A salesperson is um, very good at working in partnership, being collaborative with their customer. They might try to evoke pe a person's reasons for buying, and they can be quite accepting of whether the person buys or not. In fact, a good salesman often is really very discerning of the, the customer who's not going to buy, and then they move on to the, to the next person. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, it's just that MI is different. Perhaps it's, it's something more. Um, it's essentially about the promotion of the other's welfare. Um, setting aside ourselves, setting aside creating any benefit for ourselves. And so Bill and Steve wrote about the practitioner endeavours to have their heart in the right place. So I, I wondered, well, what is, what is compassion, really? And um, I think it's made up of a whole range of things. These are just a, a few things that I came up with. By no means am I any particular expert in this. But firstly, maybe kindness. Um, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a harder battle, said Plato. Um, maybe it's a little bit about acceptance as well. A truly compassionate attitude towards others does not change even if they behave negatively or hurt you said the Dalai Lama. And it's about sort of equality. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. Uh, it's a relationship between equals. Uh, only when we know our, our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognise our shared humanity, uh, by, said Pina Ch Chodron. And finally, too, compassion is about action. Compassion is a verb said Thich Nhat Hanh. But uh, you know, I, was, I was still a bit uncertain, really, about what this compassion thing is. So what, what's a boy to do? Well, I asked my mum. And um, I actually asked her on Saturday night when we were having our Mother's Day dinner. And she said, compassion is a feeling of understanding um, and of sorrow for the difficulty somebody else is experiencing and trying to do something about it said my mum, who was a, a GP for, for 40 years. And I think it is that. It's these two bits. It's the feeling, the, the sense of being able to feel along and with somebody, and also the willingness to do something about it, to take some sort of action. So a definition of sorts, I suppose. Um, compassion is the capacity to see clearly into the nature of another person's life. Their values and strengths, um, their dilemmas and challenges, and as well sometimes their suffering. It's a recognition that one is both separate from and not separate from that suffering, um, given the shared experience of being a part of humanity. It's being fully present to the whole story, uh, including all aspects that might influence what the other person goes on to do about their situation. And it's an aspiration towards transforming that suffering um, and active efforts to do so. At the same time, though, not being attached necessarily to the outcome of that transformation. We are not eggs. We are not eggs. Eggs have 
hard shells that are kind of protecting a, a sort of a vulnerable soft inside and yet the shells are also fragile and brittle and kind of you know break under pressure but the compassionate person the compassionate listener is kind of the opposite we have a sort of a strong back and a softer front a strong back like a, the, the, the majestic the trunk of a majestic eucalypt um, there's strength there there's emotional strength being able to to be present with the person it's about courage and wisdom it's also about perspicaciousness. I just like that word. But um, it, it's about being able to see clearly and be, uh, have the perspective and the discernment of the person and their experience. Um, and with conviction and humility as well, offer, offer the support. And it's the soft front. Um, it's about having love, that kind of non-possessive love that I think Carl Rogers used to talk about. And with kindness and care, um, acceptance and remaining calm and uncluttered, uh, being open-hearted and with patience and respect, having that empathy and understanding for the person. Compassion maybe has its enemies. Judgment, especially negative judgment, I guess, but sometimes positive judgment we have to be aware of as well. Um, feeling pity or, or sort of sorry for the person, uh, feeling fear about having to be there with them, moral outrage, um, arrogance, knowing what's best. Maybe even that thing we were talking about yesterday with our own attitude about being too busy or having too much to do. Those things might all be sort of enemies of compassion, like termites sort of eating away at the core of, of our compassion. I have um, uh, an intern at the moment whom I'm, who I'm supervising. We were talking just at the end of last week about one of her clients that she's finding really challenging. And at one point in our conversation, she sort of stopped and then she looked at me and, and tears were, were welling in her eyes. And, and she said, I, I just think I really hate this man. And I was so grateful that she said that and was able to, to reveal that to me because you know, compassion is very, very difficult. It's very difficult to be able to stay in that space. Well, for any given client that we may f not agree with or um, actually sort of feel abhorrent is, is their behaviour. Um, so compassion is very, very difficult. And one of our challenges, therefore, is, I don't know, putting some time into uh, cultivating compassion. It includes, I think, feelings of, of empathy and sort of concern, but kind of goes beyond that as well. It's about um, fostering that strength fostering that strength to be able to be present and, and sit with and listen to um, a person and their suffering. And secondly, it is about committing to take compassionate action, being willing to commit to doing things that are helpful. And thirdly, it's also about developing resilience to compassion fatigue. It is difficult work, it is hard work, and so we're trying to feel a resilience to be able to keep going with that. I just thought I'd mention this because I, I sort of stumbled across the, the Centre for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford Uni. And, and um, they've been looking at using research but also some practice to combine neuroscience, the psychological science and some spirituality to try to work out ways to cultivate compassion and to help people practice. And they have this compassion cultivation training program which is for people generally, but also they, they use it with clinicians as well. And they're using mindfulness practices, such as breathing, but also visualisation and different loving-kindness type meditations to create that feeling of compassion. Uh, they're also using collegial discussion, reflection, supervision and communication to be able to discuss those things, foster the strength. And they're using real-world homework, offering ideas for people to go out into the world and to think and feel and act compassionately, to practice that compassion. I don't like that man, said Abraham Lincoln. I must get to know him better. And I'm actually now just going to invite you all to close your eyes. This is voluntary, of course, but um, if you wouldn't mind just closing your eyes for a moment and see if you can think of someone that you are currently working with, perhaps someone 
with whom the work has been challenging. Develop a bit of a picture of that person in your mind. Feel the presence of that person in your life, in the room with you now. And now consider and say to yourself, this person is just like me. Just like me, they have a history. They were a a child once too. And just like me, this person has had ups and downs in their life. Just like me, this person has had goals and dreams. Just like me, they have strengths and qualities, fears and vulnerabilities. Just like me, they've had successes and they've made mistakes. And if you wouldn't mind just opening your eyes again. I feel that one of our challenges at the moment is about developing good practice in motivational interviewing and the inclusion now of compassion in the spirit of MI kind of requires us, I think, to, for good practice to take a moment to stop and cultivate compassion, maybe for ourselves, first of all, and you know, the hard, difficult work that we're doing, um, perhaps for our colleagues and the people that we're working with as well, and of course, for our clients, in particular, and most importantly, the, the next client that we're about to see, taking pause to cultivate that sense of compassion and a compassionate position um, for the person who's going to offer us the privilege of kind of being with them um, while they consider the prospect of change. So thank you very much. That's my presentation.